forwards and a presentation about a few things. I'm with Gang Mara, in case you don't know me. Um, I'm area sales agent for Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. Uh, but I do also have a financial interest in cords as a business. Although I'm not limited to selling cords products at the moment, that's all I'm doing. Uh, mainly because I'm supposed to be retired <laughs> and I really don't feel like putting in 60 hours a week uh, selling other stuff. So today I'd like to talk to you about uh, things like legal requirements and compliance, um, safer cabling, data rate, what's new in HDMI version 2 in case you're not aware, and some of the future problems we may well be facing, some quite serious with things like HDCP 2.2. Um, now, cords, in case you're not familiar with this, uh, we do high definition AV connectivity and um, we make very robust cables and uh, very high performance cables. We are affiliated with uh, HDMI themselves, HDMI licensing. We're an adopter uh, of HDMI 1. We're the first commercial company to be an adopter. And when HDMI 2.0 came out, we were the first company other than the uh, original consortium to become an adopter of HDMI 2. So we're on, on, the, on the wagon, ready to go straight away. All of our products are tested under HDMI standards uh, to comply with, uh, with the requirements. We're also an adopter of HD Base T, uh, which of course is the uh, extension of HDMI over CAT cables. Probably familiar with that. Um, we're a member of the Consumer Electronics Association, and in fact, our managing director David uh, is on several of their committees um, and is also. Um, a qualified trainer with CBA, which we've been had a long association with, which is the association for uh, more residential domestic type installers as opposed to the, the high end commercial people. We've also become a member of Infocom, uh, which looks after the commercial people. Uh, we're about to join Bixi, which is a building industries organisation that looks after installation of communications within structures. And um, we have a close association with Joe Kane. Joe Kane is a member of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. He's a senior engineer in the USA. He's a consultant. He was responsible for the um, American tele color television broadcast system, which actually works. He did the change for that. We're um, a supplier and qualifier of Lucasfilm's THX. Some of our cables have been. Uh, introduced a new system for um, specifying, how shall I say, for basically confirming the quality of cables among all sorts of other things. It's uh, Cow Checks have been reworked. Uh, there was a bit of a problem with them a while ago where they were not testing stuff sufficiently and giving out their logo just in return for some money and that's changed. Um, and uh, as I said, we're on HDMI version 2 adopter. So we, we don't sort of run by ourselves or just go over to China and talk to the guys there and buy some stuff and get them to put our name on it. We actually do engineer our products. Um, this, this. Now, I want to start off talking about legal requirements. This is going to become an issue in the future. Currently, it's not, but as I said, I'm, I'm talking about what's going to happen. Um, the, ACMA, Australian Communications Media Authority in Canberra, um, have now got a requirement uh, that uh, all data cables put through a wall have to be installed by a registered installer who has to do a, a training program to become registered. A science certificate must be given to the client in completion, and this includes HDMI cables. So if you punch a hole in the wall, to put HDMI cable through to a TV or to a projector, um, then you have to be registered in the same way that electricians have to be registered for high voltage or this, this is low voltage. Um, there are reasons for that. It's mostly to do with the fact there's been a lot of dodgy work done out there where people put cables next to power cables and, and crossed over and all sorts of things being done. It hasn't been fair to the consumer 
quite frankly, probably not to the installer either, who have to then spend hours and hours fixing a problem for on a non billable basis. Put an extra three hours on my job to make it work, and I don't get paid for it. Um, so it's not fair on them either. So everybody who plants a HDMI cable or a Cat6 cable or anything through a wall has to be registered and has to supply a certificate. Okay. It is not being enforced at the moment. However, um, I'll go into the however in a little while. Um, just want to talk about a few standards as well and cables. Um, CE, I think we're all familiar with it. We've seen it on electrical equipment. Uh, it's a European standard for electrical compliance and uh, to do with uh, safety, uh, voltage safety, as well as emission levels, um, EMI emissions. Um, the HDMI layer can only be used by an adopter. It is being used by people who are not adopters. It's illegal. In America, the custom stop products coming into the country that have that are illegal, for instance, that use a HDMI logo or high speed or standard logo um, when they're not an adopter. Um, we haven't been able to achieve that in Australia. ROHS um, is a European standard um, for lead free. That means that the jackets on the cables don't contain lead for it's a, it's a green thing. Um, something that is becoming important and will come more so very shortly is um, low smoke zero halogen. Um, already uh, we've seen certain industries requiring LSH. For example, I'm doing quite at the moment for a company that supplies uh, communications infrastructure on trains. And the specification there is it has to be LSH and it has to be certificates of authenticity associated with the supply of the product. Already houses that are green star rated already require this as well. Okay. The reason we want halogen free is because halogen, which is actually chlorine, um, you know, it, this is usually a PVC, polyvinyl chloride. The chloride becomes a gas if it burns and when you breathe in this chloride gas uh, it mixes with moisture, saliva and it becomes hydrochloric acid and burns you. Okay? At the very least it's, it's, it's uncomfortable if it's in very small quantities, it's in big quantities. Um, as like in some buildings where they have stacks and stacks of cat six cables, you know, just 200 cables on a big truck. That catches fire, uh, there's going to be a lot of chlorine in the air. And fire retardant breaking UL, uh, that's again is an American standard. Um, the Americans actually go further, they also have a rating called plenum, uh, where any cable that goes through a space, such as a ceiling space, a wall space, air conditioning ducts, um, has to be plenum rated if it's by itself, unless it's in a uh, conduit. If it's, if it's in a conduit, it doesn't matter. And the plenum rating uh, means in America that you have to use um, a particular product, a Teflon, which I think we're all familiar with with fry pans. It is uh, zero flame. It doesn't give off noxious fumes when burnt. There's a lot of knockoffs out there of, of this coating, um, which do give off carcinogenic um, gases. Okay, there's a lot of fry pans out there when they get to it, but they give off nasties. But the, the room core doesn't do that. So the requirement is in America is you can't don't get a plenum rating unless you use um, their chemicals, Teflon coated um, tables. Now everybody sort of taking up to that? If you've got any questions, just feel free to put your hand up. Okay, I'm saying there's no legal requirements at this time, but there's a lot of pressure to get the cowboys out of this industry. There's a lot of people who aren't doing their, their job, and there's a lot of people getting more and more upset about it. Um, Bixi is again an organisation sort of leading the fight there. Um, there's a Senate inquiry been happening into the building industry compliance standards. Uh, that was set off by the uh, scandal with the main power lead, uh, power cables I should say, that were supplied, um, which didn't meet Australian standards and actually melted and caught fire and there were fires caused by this. Uh, this, is, this is, I think, probably all read about it, where this particular product was imported from China and it just wouldn't handle our power requirements at all. 
Um, also things like the recent fires, for example the, the Docklands fire, where 11 floors of the building was taken out just down the road here. Um, somebody dropped a match onto some rubbish on, on, a, uh, uh, on a balcony, caught fire, the cladding on the building caught fire and it went off like a rocket and bang straight up 11 storeys. It's still being fought over, there's going to be a massive uh, insurance battle about that. It's going to cost a mint. Um, so, we've got actual legal requirements um, and we have implied requirements. And um, who's going to enforce it? Okay, it's not going to be government inspectors. They're not going to spend a lot of money on having inspectors everywhere inspecting everything to make sure it's right. They're going to wait for something to go wrong and then jump in. People who are going to do all this is the insurance industry. Okay, I think you probably will understand why. Um, first of all, they don't do it because the nice people are doing it for profit, which is a good thing. I have super, and I know that a lot of my super is invested in insurance companies. So the more money they make, the more better my super is going to grow. Okay, so pe people are not the insurance company, but they're all, they're all investors. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it'll be a good thing because if you supply a dodgy product, um, then uh, the insurance company will be forced to pay out and then chase the people responsible and be through the courts. And that's uh, I was speaking to a number of um, engineers and other people in the industry, sort of at the forefront, uh, a couple of universities. The general feeling is two to three years, and we're going to see this is going to become a serious problem. Today it's not. Next year, we'll probably, yeah, okay, the year after, we're going to have to start worrying about it. So all I'm doing is sending out a warning, so be, be ready. Uh, we suggest that whenever possible, that you offer compliant um, zero halogen with flame retardant cabling when possible. You suggest it to the customer that if, if you have access to these products, that they use this. If they say no, I want to use a cheaper product, then you say okay. They're, they're paying, it's up to them. Um, but if you can confirm their refusal in writing, they can cut them down the track on the off chance that something happens. Okay, the percentage probability, let's face it, isn't going to be that great. But it could happen. And all it takes is for it to happen once and you're wiped out. Um, so by offering a better product, uh, you can charge more. So you can uh, do your income a bit of a favour. Um, but you're also going to be doing the client a favour by offering the, the superior product. Now, all of our cables at the moment are to um, CE standards and to 100% lead free. That's a whole lot of them. Um, the PRO and the PRS are also fire rated. That's a longer length. That's over five metre length. And R3, which is a rack cable we'll talk about later, um, also has um, no smoke zero halogen. So the R3 has the lot. And uh, that's the best one to use in, in a green star building. Um, also the R3 and the EVS, which I've got a sample of over there, um, I don't talk about much, um, conform to this new THX standard. Um, THX do 75 tests on a cable, and they just determine, among other things, uh, conformity for electrical communications, mechanical robustness, very important. You move it, jiggle it, rip it around, pull it in and out, pull it in and out. Um, it has to keep working for years, 10 years in fact. Um, best pitch and audio results and the ability to transmit high, the high bit rate threatening the pitch to my version 2, which I'll talk about in a moment. So uh, a lot of people say, oh, I don't really care, THX, oh, that's cinema sound, uh, but it's not anymore. They've gone into setting very high standards um, for products to be used in home theatre. So sell up, do the client a favour, uh, offer safety, lifespan, performance, offer cords. I, I made this up last night, it's a bit of a dog's breakfast. Um, about this air compliance of our cables. I'm really only talking about a PRO cable, the PRS and the R3s. We do have several other cables as well. The PRO, which is the general purpose one, which is probably the most of, it's a passive cable. 
is available from half a metre up to six metres as high speed and complying and tested by HDMI to be genuine high speed and from 7.5 metres to 20 metres it is a standard HDMI. Standard means 1080p, 30 um, hertz, 8-bit um, colour and 422 colour compression. Um, in other words, your, your basic your basic sort of Blu-ray 1080p sort of thing, which means you can basically send a, a Blu-ray picture up to 20 metres using a passive cable if it's decent quality and ours will do that. We have actually had it running at 60 hertz as well, um, but we don't specify that. Um, the Pro um, and the shorter length um, does not have UL, um, but the longer length does, uh, which is of course the uh, flame retardant. PRS, um, again half a metre to five metres is high speed and it's passive and seven and a half metres to 15 metres is also high speed, so it's high speed the whole way. Uh, however, it's an active cable, an active cable on the longer length, so it's directional and has a red um, thing at the end to tell you there's got a Spectra 7 chip in it. Um, we've only gone to 15, we used to go to 18. Uh, we've determined that beyond 15 metres they, they can be problematic. I won't go into the technical reasons why that is, but they certainly can be. After 15 they seem to be quite reliable. Um, we're not big fans of active because it's the only way to get along on a, on a cable. Um, again, a UL rated. And then we have, um, oh incidentally, this, this is a, a permanent install cable. That means it really, it's, it's got a very high, I think three kilos pulling pressure. So when you plug it in, it sort of stay there. It's not designed to be taken in and out all the time. So you install it and then you leave it. Okay, you can do it a few times, but not too often. Um, then our R3, which is our rack mount, was designed as a rack mount, but it's now being used for all sorts of other things as well, as it turns out. It's, it's from 0.3 of a metre. That's 300 mil. Um, six, 600, 900, 1200, etc. So it's a length of 300 mil, which is an American foot. Uh, so American states, it's um, uh, one foot to ten foot. Um, rack mount, you can put it in there as much as you like. It's, it's, it's very, very short mounting depth. And uh, it's a very thin cable and can be bent without any loss of performance down to 20 mil diameter. Um, now it has the works, so it has fire retardant, zero halogen, THX approved, and of course lead like a lot of them. Um, in the THX we have another cable called EVS, which is a silver coated wire one, um, designed specifically for a really high grade audio, and that is also THX approved. All of our cables, every single one of them is tested in the factory before it leaves. Now, we're the only company in the world that do that. Okay, we've had, it costs us money. Uh, and the owner of the factory who does our assemblies so said we're easily the fussiest customer that they've got of all the people in the world. And they deal with Sony and Belkin and, and, and everybody, their dog, um, Monster, etc. So all the major brands are all being assembled in this place. We're the fussiest. We took that as a compliment. <laughs> and um, all of our cables are 100% compliant. So if it's high speed, it's high speed. It's 240 megahertz. Not a lot of people still have high speed cables because they pass 1080p, they seem to think that that makes them high speed. In actual fact, uh, standard HDMI. Um, so, the frequency, of game of high speed? High, high speed, uh, to be qualified um, as high speed, it has to pass 340 megahertz. Now that's the clock speed. We never use more than 297 in practice. So we have cables that, in practice, will pass 297 and can be claimed to be high speed. The thing about that is, uh, if there are any problems in the system, then they may not function. That's why HDMI insists on 340 to give the headroom to allow for other factors. Now the major factors are that HDMI is three parts. It's not just a cable, HDMI is um, a transmitter for the source, the interconnect and the sync, which is what receives a silicon that receives a signal. Now that can be in a display, it can be in a 
an AB receiver, it can be an electric switch, whatever. Um, and there are always problems associated with the two bits on the end. They will contribute a fair bit to the failure of certain bits to be passed accurately. Okay. I can show for example, um, this is, a, you know, I've brought this here before, some of you may have seen it. Um, this is a I.O. board from a Yamaha audio visual receiver. Here's some HDMI ports and you'll see that um, see, there's this tracks all the way around here leading to silicon and silicon. So this is a long way to go. This is a fairly short way to go. So these ports straight away, this one's going to be far more influenced by uh, emissions from the amplifier. Keep in mind that an AVR is a power amplifier. Okay? And the cheaper ones don't have a lot of shield. So there's going to be a lot of nasties hitting, hitting this. The more expensive Yamaha AVRs have more chips and short tracks. Okay? And that's, that's just one thing out of a squillion different things that can happen. Does that answer my question? Or? Yeah, no, I guess the specifics of you know, 4K, is it 444, is it... Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later what, what the requirements are there. Um, and yeah, let's, let's talk about bandwidth. TCPIP, um, which is your normal process for internet and local area networking. Um, TCPIP uses packets as checksum. So there's little bits of, the, the data is broken up into little bits. Um, it's sent through. Uh, there's a system which checks that everything's okay. And there's a code sent with it that says it's got to be in this form. If it's not right, it sends back and says, send packet number such and such again. So there's data going back and forth, data being repeated over and over again. And you can sort of see that if there's a lot of problem in the transmission of the data, uh, that things are going to get really, really slow. Okay. People often blame the service provider for slow internet, um, and quite often it's <laughs> service provider, but it can also be influenced by simply um, crook, poor cabling. Okay. Now, once upon a time when there wasn't a lot of data being sent, it didn't matter. These days, even a basic web page is starting to get pretty big. Okay. So things are just going slower and slower and slower, and it's amazing what a difference a better cable does. Wi-Fi, great, as long as there's no interference, as long as there aren't other people around, as long as not too many people are using it at the same time. And uh, as far as ca cabling is concerned, depending on how many other people that are on your node um, are also busy at the time, if some parts of the day are slower than other parts. Okay, that's got nothing to do with the cable. Generally speaking, with TCP IP, our speeds are um, 10100 base T, which is still the most common form of LAN, which is 100 megabits per second, and 1000 base T, which is 1 gigabit per second. We are seeing more and more 1000 um, base T getting around, which is great. Um, there is, um, I've really been testing 5 gig per second and 10 gig per second. So we see a magnification. The problem with these is there's a lot of technology and engineering at the moment. Only the 5 gig, only a really good engineer who really knows what they're doing can use it because the protocols have become very complex. Um, and ideally, it should be done with fiber rather than with copper. Okay, so we need that. Uh, and and that's, that's already happening with uh, a lot of our commercial customers are already doing that in, in some of the big buildings, universities, hospitals, and so on. Um, Wi-Fi, um, there's been oh good, uh, I think about 15 different specifications for Wi-Fi since it came out. Currently we're on 11 AC, which is the most common one, but not everybody's got that. It depends really on your, on your router, what you've got there. Uh, and we're running about 780 megabits per second, which is slower than the 1000 uh, on cable. Um, but are way faster than 100. Okay, so a lot of people find their Wi-Fi is faster than their uh, speeds on, on their copper on their computer. Um, there is talk of 100 gig Wi-Fi. Uh, 
it's it's scary. It's quite frankly, well, it doesn't take much interference to happen when you pass out the data through the air. Um, broadband internet, um, big fears. Um, ADS one was was eight meg per second. Um, ADSL2 Plus is 20, cable is between 30 and 100, now I've got cable at home, and I'm getting between 64 and 75 meg per second, which is bloody good, I reckon. Um, and NBN is going to be, the uh, lowest level of NBN is going to be 12, so just having NBN doesn't mean it's going to be faster than what you had before, and, um, and you're paying for the different levels, but really up to the ISP, exactly what's going to happen there. Uh, up to 100, which means that NBN, um, theoretically 125, but nobody believes it'll happen. Uh, basically, cable and NBN are going to be the same. So I've got cable, and the guy said, I went in and got a new plan the other day from Telstra, and I said, oh, I've got NBN coming in about two years. I said, don't hurry. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy. But to, to get that in perspective, 100 megabits per second is, is really, it's very little. Uh, it, it is very, very slow. Um, HDMI and HD base T. Standard HDMI is 2.2 gigs per second. Um, high speed is 10.2 gigs per second. Um, as I said there, I mentioned before, it has to be tested 340 it should be MH, not HH, typo. Um, but it's never more than 297. That's the highest that anybody's sending stuff at. Um, in practice, um, 1080p uh, at its maximum, which is um, 60 hertz, 3D, and 2160p, which, are, which some people correctly call 4K, is UHD. Um, 8 bit. 420 compression uses 8.91. So we say at the moment HDMI version 1, we're talking 9 gigabits per second. With HDMI version 2, um, it's all changed. Up to now, from HDMI 1.8 to 1.4b, it's more or less all been the same. All I've done is with each version, they've added additional capabilities, new sound formats and, and, and stuff like that. Okay, they added a few new connectors, etc. It's, it's basically it's HDMI 1. With HDMI 2, um, it's, it's now introduced a, new, a few new concepts. Um, oh, no, I really haven't got this in logical order. I'm sorry, I still worked on this yesterday. Um, just, just to um, Summarise TCP IP 1 gigabit per second, LAN uh, 0.78 gigabits per second, uh, HDMI will be up to 18 gigabits per second, broadband near 8 meg to 125 meg nominally. Um, now, the, the issue, you know, we, we've been arguing with HDMI licensing about this for a while. And I think finally there's been a result, although whether it's our harping on it that's made the difference, I don't know. But the fact is, the new HMI uh, version 2.0, not 2.2, sorry, uh, allows up to 18 gigs per second, but no clock increase. Now, with clock, I don't know if you understand, clock, you have one cycle, and there's X number of bits have to be synchronised with it. Clock is there to synchronise the three channels. And uh, so, obviously, the faster the clock, the more bits per second you can, you can punch out. So, now, can you, do you understand that or? No, you didn't. Um, okay, now the thing is that what I said with HDMI version 2.0 is um, that <coughs> the clock stays at 297. They haven't increased the clock speed. But they're going to now have 40 bits per clock instead of 10. Okay, so there's a massive increase um, or, or compressed into one, one clock. Now, HDMI said, well, we haven't increased the, what they call the bandwidth, which is the clock, which isn't the data, it's only the clock. They said, we haven't increased that, so you don't need to change your cables. 
And we're saying, but you're now putting 40 bits per instead of 10 bits per, four times the data than before, and you're saying we don't need different cables. Of course we do. It's nonsense. And they said, no, we're sticking with high speed. And just going to be high speed, and that's it. The fact of the matter is that if you have a six metre cable, high speed cable, uh, which is genuine high speed at six metres, um, if you punch the maximum through, I be through that, you're not going to get six metres, you're only going to get four metres. So it's not going to be high speed, a six metre cable won't be high speed with 4K. It's, it's, it's nonsense. So, so how do you, you, or the users or whatever, know whether this cable can actually handle the 18 gig? Yeah. Now, people are going to write it on the paper that it can, it, it won't. You know, you've done a lot of testing, it might happen. HDMI finally indicated that they are going to change the rating and uh, they're still going to call it, they're not going to back down at the high speed, they're going to call it something else like enhanced high speed or super high speed or something and, um, and, that, and that, sort of, that sort of it. Uh, so that's good because we're really concerned about that. Now what is new on HDMI 2? Uh, we have a maximum bit rate now going up from 9 to 18 gigs per second possible. At this stage there's no 3D. Um, which is a good thing because the 3D they brought out uh, with HDMI 1 um, or 1.4 was at 60 hertz and it's not enough. You, uh, sorry, it was, it was just 25 frames per second at the end of the day. And there's an argument that says it needs to be minimum 72. Now Peter Jackson on his Hobbit film, 3D films, uh, he went for um, double frame rate, so 24 frames per second, which is the standard movie speed. He went to 48, called it high frame rate, HFR. And yes, the 3D was better, it was easy on the eye. It wasn't enough, and it needs to be double that again. The thing is, if you're going to start punching 70, 80, 90 frames per second through, uh, as opposed to the current, basically 24, um, the, the data rate is just going to go absolutely through the roof. So 4K high frame rate isn't, isn't going to cut it. It's just not going to happen. Um, up to now we've only had 30 hertz uh, or 25 hertz for Australia, 24 frames per second. Um, it is being doubled. Um, in most cases it's just a, a, a firmware upgrade on the equipment used. They're going to allow 32 channels of sound. So instead of having a, a 7.2, which is the most common system we have now, uh, it's going to be 30.2 or whatever. Uh, and they're going for it can handle the three quarter pixel shape, which is a flatter pixel like that. So when you have an anamorphic lens, you spread it out to give cinema scope. Um, it works and it, it will pass transmittance in, in that form. Uh, up the audio sampling rate, possible. Um, you can have simultaneous dual video, in other words, you have two completely different pictures on the same screen, and just by using 3D glasses. One person can see one perspective, the other person can see something else at the same time. So you can have a car race on one screen, and you have two different perspectives, um, and up to four audio users at the same time. And, um, and of course, the new version 2 mode, as they call it, for 40 bits per clock. Um, now, the fact that something claims to be version 2 doesn't mean it can do all of these things. Okay? It, at the moment, when people say version 2, they really just mean 60 hertz. Um, and doesn't mean that it can handle all of these other things. Therefore, um, any device that claims to be HDMI version 1.4b, HDMI version 2.0, or anything like that, it's meaningless gibberish. HDMI don't allow it, okay? If somebody's doing it, it means that they're not compliant because you can't get compliance on your packaging, can't get approval if you say that this is a version 2 or whatever. Um, unfortunately, people are still doing it and some of the worst offenders are the people who own HDMI, people like Panasonic and Sony, etc. They do it and it's illegal by it their own standards, because they own HDMI. It's, it's run by Silicon Graphics, but 
like to my Lego's owned by this consortium. Um, and it, it's a real problem. People, people will assume. Uh, now, future problems. Uh, okay. UHD Blu-ray disc players. Um, the first player is due out early next year. Uh, January, February in Japan. It was due out in November, but obviously there's been delays. Uh, we think it'll probably be here by late 2016. Probably three months after Japan, America will have it. Um, it will use version 2 specs which haven't been used before, so the equipment uh, is going to have the ability to run the, the specification. That doesn't matter if it's not called version 2, it, it's got to be able to do whatever is on there, okay, um, colour, etc, etc. Um, and you look at your list of specs to see what the compatibility is between things that you're putting together, not what the version is, because the version tells you nothing. Um, cabling devices that work with full high definition, can AEP, may not work with the Blu-ray, because this the new Blu-ray will be our first taste of real 4K, because up to now it, it's been very limited, it's only been uh, 30 hertz or 25 hertz. Okay. So it's and uh, there's other things too, there's going to be much deeper colour as standard, um, which also increases the, the file size, the amount of data that needs to be transmitted. So, um, but there will be software, okay, people like Sony who own a number of studios have been mastering everything in 4K for about the last seven years, I believe, so they'll be ready to rock and roll, the discs will be out there, they'll probably be hellish and expensive. I think they've missed the boat. Um, Everybody's streaming now. People don't care about having a disc. People with discs are putting them, like me, are putting them onto hard drives, get quicker access, and people are streaming. So will UHD BD be a success? I, well, the jury's out. Um, HGCP, I think we're starting to run low on time. Um, HGCP 2.2, this is high bandwidth digital content protection. Now the whole point of HDMI was content protection. Uh, this is why people like Sony, Panasonic, um, several of the studios, etc., came up with this thing because they want to stop piracy. Now it's the easiest thing in the world to rip, <laughs> to rip this now. You can do software, you don't even need hardware anymore. So they've now brought out 2.2, which will be pirate proof for the next couple of years, I guess. Um, no, maybe, maybe not that long. <laughs> maybe three minutes, get through, yes. Okay, but it, it, it's a much more complex system. The thing is, is it's designed for Blu-ray players playing the new UHD discs um, and repeaters. The thing is, there's no backwards compatibility. Okay, up to now, HDMI has been backwards compatible. Uh, so there's a big bun fight going on out there, all led by ignorance because none of us really understand what the, what the repercussions are and just how bad it is. Uh, again, the SMPTE, the American uh, Motion Picture and Television Engineers Association, put out a white paper on it and they had a number of fairly serious errors in it where they obviously misunderstood. Um, our MD, David, has just been commissioned by CEDIA to get the facts of the matter. Um, and he's going to, basically it's a six months project where we can talk to everybody involved, put it all together and make some sort of sense out of it. What, what does it mean? What are our problems going to be? Installers problems, suppliers problems, things don't work. Oh, well, you've used your best cable, Mr. Cords, but it still doesn't work. And uh, say, well, they just sort of out your HCCP 2.2 problems, and they'll say, oh, I know you're just trying to get out of it. Uh, you know, I, I, I see problems for us, and I see problems for you guys. Um, but we have to wait and see what's happening. So now HCCP, of course, is a subsidiary of, of Intel. So we reckon it's all Intel's fault. Uh, everyone's getting the in a knot. There's a lot of confusion. Not sure of the extent of the problems and not backwards compatible. So everybody's scared. Cables and repeaters. Um, Non-compliant cables will have worked for a while uh, with full high definition. Um, may still work but perform even worse with UHD. Um, so 
at the moment, the like for the UHD we've got at the moment is no different to full high definition. 1080p, 2160p is more or less the same based on the way it's been. So yes, this will work with 4K, but the old 4K, not the new 4K that's coming. Um, and this applies especially to extenders that use cats. X cables, like that's cat 5, 5A, 5 6, 6A, six, 7. Um, now, with streaming as opposed to TCP IP, uh, with streaming, you know, because there's no, say again please, there's no checksum, um, the cable really has to be up to scratch. All video streaming, which means anytime you use a HD based T extender, has to have a shielded cable has to. Um, otherwise you're gonna have in you're gonna have sometimes you have problems, sometimes you won't. Today it works, tomorrow it doesn't. Uh, and the quality of the picture is going to be quite inferior. The TCP IP, HDMI over IP as they call it, it's not HDMI over IP. HDMI is uncompressed, IP is highly, highly compressed. So you don't get anything like a picture of sound quality when transmitting over IP. Okay. So you have to send it over HD base T, which is about the only system that, that works. It works well, it's a good system, and uh, but you do need a decent cable. Uh, the cable should be at least 350 or 400 megahertz rated. Um, your standard unshielded twisted pair cable that has been used up to now is usually about 250. Um, CAT 6, 250, CAT 6, uh, 6A can be uh, 400, 600 hertz, uh, which means you can pass almost two and a half times more data down the line, probably more reliable. I carry this cable around with me. Now, we don't sell it cords, we don't have a CAT cable um, yet. We will, but we, we're sort of sussing out what's, what's going to be required. This is a Swiss-made cable with a Swiss-made connector on the end. I use this for troubleshooting. And when somebody has a problem um, with our HD base T extenders, I simply plug this in, bang, bang, works beautifully. Use shielded. This, this cable is a, um, um, that's what they call foiled, foil foil. That is, there's a foil around the outside of all the wires. And then there's foils around each individual pair as well. The connector, this is a connector which sells for about eighteen dollars. Or if you buy a thousand of them, you're going to for about thirteen dollars each. <laughs> okay, and you need two of those um, versus eighty cents for a unshielded cable type of connector, which is what people have been using and are still using every day now. Okay, I, I keep getting people coming to me and saying, "Oh, look, um, the client's gone ahead and put in UTP um, unshielded twisted pair." Uh, who is electrician? Electrician has done it because he's wired up the house for our computer system, and he's also done this for the AV. And I'm sorry, computer system, eh? AV, eh? Because you're going to be streaming, you're going to be Netflixing, uh, etc. Um, so this this is very high grade. Now, one of my good customers uh, down in Docklands uh, has come from nowhere in three years. They're really really surging ahead. Um, they only use that whenever there's video involved and they still use a basic shielded cable with a good connector even for, for data. Um, they absolutely refuse to use anything other than that um, with their clients. I just tell them outright it's video. They know that when they put that in, that's actually a Swiss, Swiss made thing. I'd love to be able to sell it but I've got to convince them. Um, they put that in, they go plug, plug and it works. Okay, no comebacks, no, um, no hours aren't billable, etc. They go in there, the job's going to take eight hours and it's done. Okay, and I'm just mucking around for four hours trying to sort things out. Um, so you can make a lot of money by using slightly more expensive cable in the first place if it's going to do the job. Um, so, um, so I suggest you at least use. Um, okay, shielding is critical, not unshielded twisted pair, use foiled unshielded twist, twisted pair which is foiled around the outside but unshielded uh, four pairs inside or foiled foiled or shielded 
foil. Shield is usually a metal foil, usually around the outside. Um, it does stiffen the cable even more, but if you have foil around each pair plus shielding around the outside jacket, it's, it's going to be bulletproof. Okay, you can, you can run it past power connect and all sorts of things. Um, when you consider what's actually inside a typical HDMI cable, in terms of the shielding on the wires and the shielding around the outside and the rest, that's not a, a ridiculous requirement, is it? No, when you think about no, it, you know, it's, it's, eight bits of copper inside plastic sheets with a pad of plastic on exactly. the outside. Exactly, and it doesn't, it doesn't cost the world. It, it costs, you know, we're talking about the difference between probably, say, 25 cents a metre versus a really top cable which is under a dollar a metre. You know, it's, it's not a lot when you're, when you're doing 15 metres. For, for what it saves you in time. Okay. Now, however, when you're using shielded cable, your connector has to be consistent. It has to be the right diameter of entry and it has to be able to handle the shielding as well for the type of shielding being used. So um, once you get into the shielded thing, you've also got to have a really good look at connectors because they, um, they're, they're critical. So it's not much point having it shielded if you can't terminate the shielding. And, um, uh, and if you don't get a decent fit. Now, this cable I showed you there, that's, it's a Swiss cable. Their connectors are like this, that's expensive cable. They're very easy to, to put together. There's no crimping required. Um, but the, the accuracy here is, is incredible. We're, we're talking microns. The fit is going to be precise. Um, what is even more important is, and that doesn't apply to you guys because you don't do uh, big installations, but the receiver for those, but the female connector, has to be shielded in itself as well as being perfect in its fit. So the two really go together. So most of the manufacturers that make this stuff also make receivers to, to accept these. They give them different names. And Clips will call them, got a funny name. Um, but they're quite easy to put together to uh, terminate in the field. And like I said, you don't need a crimper. Uh, and uh, very, very important. Oh, I'm going through an exercise at the moment. I'm testing a whole lot of, a number of different cables. I've had samples sent and a number of different connectors and see if I can get a, a nice match. Um, I will be at IOC in Amsterdam in February for the, the big uh, trade show there. And I'll see if I can find a, a decent European distributor perhaps who isn't represented in Australia at this point. Um, but for the moment, uh, I can't offer anything. I believe that Radio Parts uh, are selling UTP. I believe they're getting some foiled, foil twisted pairs. Um, and hopefully you'll have appropriate connectors for those as well. And I would recommend that when they become available to start using them. Okay. Uh, yeah, video streaming as I mentioned before. Streaming sites are increasing their resolutions. They generally still use compression, however, and uh, there's some quite good compression systems available. Um, so Netflix sending 1080p. They're talking about sending 4K in, in America, 360p. Um, but uh, you can still have problems if you use UTP. So basically any streaming, and, 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 and look ahead a little bit. Um, it's okay to say, okay, today, the UTP cable works, but what happens when they sign up with Netflix and Netflix starts offering, or, or, or any of the other stand, or any of the others start offering a high resolution? All of a sudden, it's not going to work anymore, and they're going to be upset. Um, optical fiber is obviously the go. Uh, this, is, we've, this has been obvious for, for several years now. We've been hassling HDMI because we were really appropriate people to come up with a standard for HDMI over fiber. And they're sort of saying, mm, talk to the uh, they're not getting pressured by their owners. That's, that's the bottom line. And they don't want to make waves. When the owners wake up to the problem, because they really don't understand Panasonic, Samsung, Sony don't get it. They don't understand HDMI at all. Um, and uh, and that I don't realise that what we need, we need a stand for it. Because with fibre, you can have single strand, you can have multiple strand, you have different optical purities, and you can have different term terminators. Um, so what we need is, is a connector for the end, a termination, 
for the optical fiber and we need a stand. What I'm going to have eight, eight strands. Uh, it doesn't have to be crystal, it doesn't have to be lower purity. Can we use a nice flexible plastic material? But above all, what sort of termination are we going to do? So we've got HDMI in, then HDMI over optical to, to copper at the other end. At the moment, people are making do. Um, there is uh, a bit of a pressure. We've had a really good look at it. Uh, I'm not convinced yet. Is to have a hybrid system where you have, uh, say, four optical fibres, one for each, one for clock, and three for um, uh, for, for the actual colour channels, and um, and then have copper for the uh, for the for the other controlled stuff, what they call the DDC, the things like the EDIT and etc. etc. Um, probably optical the whole way and not be strained. I think it's probably the way to go. But I don't know. But we're going to keep keep at it. Now, I'm sure I haven't explained everything all that well, so there must be some questions. Is it? Yeah. That's it. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Walter. Okay. Now, what, I, what I've presented you with there, and uh, have I gone in too deep, not deep enough? It, it, it's, it's not exactly an exciting subject. Is it? <laughs> this, this <thing laughs> so is, I congratulate you for staying awake anyway. The thing is, it's something that you know, installers and our guys have to deal with every day. You know, yes. Selling HDMI cables is sort of one of the standard things that we do. <coughs> And knowing the differences between them and why you should be going higher spec or when you shouldn't be and the standards for different jobs and the rest of it's important too. Mm. And knowing, you know, and knowing that half the installers that come in to buy a $5 cable should be using a $50 or a $150 one depending on what they're doing, that's important too. Yes, I have something that actually works. So I'm amazed, you know, we've gone very heavily into, into commercial. I was amazed how many people say, oh, we never use HDMI over 10 metres. They say, why not? Oh, it doesn't work. Well, doesn't that tell you something about what you've been using? Yeah. Okay, because I can guarantee you, absolutely guarantee you, lifetime guarantee on the product, it will work up to 20 metres. Um, so, um, and they go, oh. It's, um, the only other question I had, I guess, was for products, let's say, like big AV receivers and so mm -hmm. on that are starting to print HDMI 2, version 2.0 on their boxes and, you know, Blu-rays and so on for it all, what's the likelihood that something's actually going to happen about that and say, no, you can't advertise this this way or you're not compliant or anything else like that? Um, so there's going to be a lot of driving it from behind. Um, no, there, there's, there's no driving it at all because the people who are the worst offenders are the people yeah. who whose um, subsidiary also makes the rules. Um, so that's not going to happen. Um, ha we also have this, this issue now that um, certain ports on some TVs are marked as HDMI version 2. Now what that does is it implies that it's capable of doing the 40 bits per clock as opposed to the standard 10 bits per clock. That's what I've taken it as meaning, but nobody seems to be able to tell me, but I think that's probably what it is, which means you can, you can pump in these higher bid rates into the thing and it can, it can process it. However, can it process HDCP 2.2? Yeah. And if it can't, the, the argument that I've heard is, and don't quote me on this because, like, as I said before, there's so much confusion. Uh, I've been told that um, HD CP 2.2 is not backwards compatible and is not firmware upgradable, but it needs different silicon. Okay. Um, now that's what I've been told. Like I said, we, Dave is about to start a project to try and determine all of these, look at all the different myths, and see which ones are true and which ones aren't, so that we know where we stand and he'll put out a white paper on behalf of CDA uh, on the whole issue. Yeah. And a lot of the manufacturers as well are obviously in a 12 month to, you know, product development cycle or a new product cycle and so they have to have whatever the latest is for the next generation mm -hmm. even if that means we can't get 2.2 until the next year then they just have to advertise whatever they can get up to right now so yeah, yeah I can understand it. The only other thing I had to say I guess was on the UHD Blu-rays if you know doing things like HDCP and making that more complicated confusing and dangerous you know, not dangerous but worse for the consumers you know, you've already got a format that might be in trouble before it even comes out. 
you know, due to lack of interest, you know, thanks to streaming yes. and those sort of internet connections, yes. then you make it tougher to even, you know, plug the, plug the product in and make it work. Exactly. They're really kicking themselves in the foot and the head at the same time by doing it that way. Exactly. The, the big problem is that two years late, yeah. it was due out two years ago, and um, as I said before, I'm not convinced it's going to be a success. Okay, I was very optimistic when Blu-ray first came out, so I really give you. This is, this is going to be terrific, and it was. Um, but this, I think, this is a little bit late, and um, no, it's it's no, there's going there's going to be there's certainly going to be issues. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the, the powers that be deal with it, so sort of when it does hit, which is in about a year's time, uh, we'll be sort of getting into it. And uh, the first of these things will start to appear out there in Australia. Uh, the Japanese are going to have to deal with it now. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what they do. But they'll probably, they'll probably be all new TVs, all new AVRs, and uh, it also means new switches and, and, and everything else. Um, also, uh, HD Base T, isn't going to be able to handle it. It cannot handle maximum 4K. It cannot at any length. So now I ask the question, what if we, instead of it going, say, 100 metres, uh, it, it only does 30. I said, no, it can't do it at all. Okay. They claim to have a chip that could do it. Now they've got a chip uh, which will do it with optical, sort of, but then again, they don't have a standard for that either. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So that's just sort of things to look forward to. Really appreciate it.